Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. Uh, this time it's episode 141, and we're going to talk about scamping. Scamping? I may have made up a word, probably not, but it's the reason there was no episode last week, and I shall explain. We're also going to talk about installing a Chinese diesel heater, which I actually did, folks! It's true! I accomplished something! And a place to visit that involves a lot of violence. (laughs) Okay, we got a whole potpourri of interesting and perhaps gruesome things to talk about this week. But first, I have to offer you apologies. For those of you who listen every week, you did not get the joy of listening to my dulcet tones. Yeah, uh... I didn't do a podcast last week. I apologize for that. The reason is the topic of this week's podcast, which I shall now explain. I had an entire podcast planned out for last week. I was going to talk about shopping for adventure clothing and that experience, and I may talk about that in the future, but something happened. Yes, I got a message from a friend saying, uh, you need to come to South Dakota and buy this from me. And he was right. And the thing I needed to buy was a scamp. What is a scamp, you might ask? Well, many of you know a scamp already. It is a very small fiberglass RV, a trailer specifically. I don't believe there are any scamps with engines in them. And uh, yeah, this is a classic RV that has a following similar to Airstreams, except these are made out of fiberglass. And they were fairly inexpensive, but their biggest selling feature was that they are so lightweight. This 13-foot scamp that I picked up weighs less than a thousand pounds and that means you can tow it with almost anything let's back up a bit here this is a van life channel and this year i've spent an awful lot of time talking about a winnebago and some empty land and now a trailer what does this have to do with van life well to me all these things are related and i don't have any problem with saying that a scamp is included in the entire van life umbrella in fact there are some fairly famous youtubers who live in scamps full time even a 13 foot one if you've never seen one of these i encourage you to hit pause and then google scamp trailer These things are based on a Canadian company's design for a trailer called a bowler. And I'm kind of amused by the fact that every one of my Canadian friends who sees this thing says, oh, look at that old bowler. And I'm like, what's a bowler? So it's kind of just, you know, there are neighbors up north, but to many Americans, there's still this great blank white space on the map. And uh, I... I'm trying to overcome that. At any rate, I know it is a scamp. There are other brands of trailers that are very similar. There was the Bigfoots, there are Casitas, there are Burrows, and there was even a U-Haul trailer. Very, very similar to this. In the 80s, U-Haul actually had RVs you could rent, and that, that didn't last very long. But now they're highly sought after. That's the weird thing about these. This is a 1993 Scamp 13, and... It has held its value. These fiberglass trailers, like Airstreams, will depreciate, of course, but they'll hit this point that they won't depreciate anymore. And if you can keep them up in good shape, they're still worth a good amount of money. Much more than the -the run-of-the-mill Coachman's or Keystone's or anything like that. So... Opportunity knocked, and I I bought it. I hopped in my van, ambulance, and drove to South Dakota got all the way to Beloit, Wisconsin, and realized that I'd forgotten my wallet, which is an important thing if you want to buy diesel fuel for the return trip home, drove all the way back to Chicago, got my wallet, and then went all the way to South Dakota, and indeed picked up the Scamp. So, it's a 1993 Scamp 13. For those interested in van life, trailers present an interesting option. So let's say that you you are interested in van life, but your circumstances are such that you have a Toyota Camry or a Ford Taurus or maybe, you know, a Ford Escape, but something that, sure, people have turned them into campers, but really isn't ideal for it. Well, something like an old scamp just might be perfect for you because, again, they, they last really well. The fiberglass doesn't rust. And you can redo the inside very easily. So keep your Camry, keep your old Escape, put a hitch on it, and think about 
getting an old scamp. Now, they're, they're a little bit hard to find, and they can be pricey, but if you can find just the right one like I did, it can be a really good solution. Now, why specifically scamps? Well, I mean, obviously, there's the fiberglass, so they don't rust. Well, the way they're built is very, very simple, and that's good. <laughs> if you have an old vehicle, you want simple. I, I can't imagine anyone is going to want to work on a 30-year-old Tesla, because it's just going to be all circuits. But a 30-year-old trailer, if you are looking for one, you're going to want one that's very simple so you can get at everything, and the scamp is that in spades. It's just two big pieces of fiberglass attached together in the middle, and then kind of some stuff in there. And all that stuff can be moved around and changed. The way things are attached to the walls is literally a rivet goes through the side of the trailer, so you can see both sides of it. You can see the inside and outside. It, it's really, really easy easy to work on. And you might think, well, this thing's 13 feet. And yes, that includes the tongue. The interior space is only 10 feet. <laughs> How can that be big enough to do anything with? Well, the truth is that I'm six foot tall and I can stand up in this thing. And there's more space back there than there is in my ambulance. So space is not the problem. Now, they don't come with bathrooms in most cases. There are some that come with bathrooms. But if you get one with a bathroom, you're giving up the couch. I should probably talk about the basic layout of these things. There's a door. Surprise, surprise. You open the door. On your left, there is a dinette. Of course, the table lowers and turns it into a bed. It's a fairly good-sized bed. These things are wide enough that at six feet, I can lay width-wise in them, which I can't do in my ambulance. Then next to that is a cabinet, a countertop with a two burner stove in it and a very simple sink that usually just has a hand pump. Sometimes they have a little bit more fancy sinks, but that's always easy to change for you. Above that, there is typically an overhead counter. Built into that cabinet is often a propane heater. It's a very small propane heater, but this is a very small space. And then to the right of that, going across the front of the trailer, is a couch. And the back of the couch flips up to form a bunk bed. So this thing can actually sleep four. But what most people do that I've seen is they don't have four people in there. They have two or one people. And they will leave the table and dinette made up into a bed. And then they will live off the couch. Anyway, if you are thinking of living in a van, there's plenty of space in this camp. That is not a problem. So given that these things are fairly inexpensive, why isn't everyone doing this? I mean, you have the best of both worlds here, right? Like, let's say you have a Jeep Wrangler, a vehicle that is not very easy to live in, yet some people still do it. Well, you want to go to the desert? Great. You disconnect the trailer, you take the Jeep, you crawl all over the rocks, and you go back and you have your nice living space. It's the best of both worlds, right? Well, no, because you have this trailer you have to deal with. And it's not like you can just park it anywhere. They can be stolen. They can be considered abandoned. They can be towed away. I mean, it, it's one thing to park your car on the street, but to park a trailer with no vehicle, that is a whole other world of issues. Plus, you have to be comfortable towing a trailer. It's always a little bit of a challenge to back up with a trailer, and in high wind situations, trailers can be difficult, and you have to learn how to load a trailer. Scamps and all the other trailers like this have a bit of a design flaw, in my opinion, which is that the water tanks are mounted behind the wheels. And this puts a significant amount of weight at the back of the trailer. And if you know anything about trailers, that's bad. You want most of your weight before the wheels so that there's a lot of weight on the tongue and that helps keep the trailer stable at highway speeds. If you have weight behind the back wheels, they tend to sway, and that can create this feedback where the swaying gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and in some cases, that swaying will actually throw your car off the road. That may sound like hyperbole, but I promise you that it isn't. And one last thing about the scamps, because I've got a lot of other stuff to talk about this week. One great thing about owning a scamp, specifically a scamp, is that the company is still in business and they still make exactly the same trailer. If you take my 1993 trailer and park it next to a 1972 Scamp and park it next to a 2022 Scamp, they look the same. There are, of course, differences. One's going to have LED lights versus regular old lights, and the heater may be a little different, etc., but they're basically the same thing. The molds are a little different, but, I mean, they're the same, and that means you can go to the factory and get parts, which I just did. There's a gravel shield across a very generous front window in this thing, and during my drive back from South Dakota, one of the hangers broke loose. It's just war. I mean, it's 30 years old. And I was able to just go to scamp.com, scamptrailers.com specifically, and buy one. 
or actually I had to buy a whole kit, but I was able to do that. I was able to get these custom made specific parts just for that RV because the company is still in business and still supports the older models. That's it for the scamp. That's why there was no podcast last week. I will probably talk about it some more. The scamp is in pretty good shape. It needs a little bit of work. Uh, what happens with fiberglass trailers is that if they sit out in the sun, the gel coat kind of gets dull and then fiberglass can turn a little bit of powdery and you have to jump on that before it gets too bad. And mine is at the stage where that all needs to be refinished, but it eh, doesn't matter. I always wanted one of these things, and now I've got, like, my own RV park <laughs> on the banks of the Illinois River, uh, and maybe I will invite some of you guys to come check it out sometime. I don't know. Right now, it's a little bit too dangerous, because we still have a lot of holes in the ground that you could easily just kind of fall into and disappear. Tech Talk. All right, this will be a little bit of a long Tech Talk, because I finally did it. Yes, folks, I worked on my van. I know, it's a shock, but what I did was I installed the Chinese diesel heater, finally. And I wanted to tell you in depth about my experience with that because I know, especially this time of year, everybody's thinking about it. First off, which one did I get? Because if you go on eBay or Amazon or you look to try to buy one of these things, you are completely overwhelmed. And they all look the same, except they're all slightly different, and the controllers are very different. So I will link in the show notes the one I specifically bought. It's one that I did a lot of research on, and it's the name that kept coming up as one of the best low-price diesel heaters. This is not an Eberspatcher. This is not a Lavinair. This is a cheap Chinese diesel heater. And it's a Vivor. V-E-V-O-R. I don't know anything about the company. All I know is that they have a website and they have a lot of decent reviews that I have vetted. So anyway, I'm happy with it. All the little things to check when you buy one of these things, like does it have a good quality fuel line and does it have a good controller and those kind of things, this thing checked off those boxes. So I was happy with it, but ultimately there's probably 800 others that are just as good. All right, now let's talk about installing this thing. In my case, because I have a Mercedes Sprinter with an upfitters package that came from the dealer, I have a tube in my diesel tank designed specifically for attaching things to. So all I had to do was buy a connector. I'll have a link in the show notes for that too. It's a very specific connector for sprinters that I snapped on and then I could attach a hose to it and I was done with fuel. That's all I had to do. I didn't have to install the tank. I didn't have to like drop my tank and attach anything. So that was a big advantage to me because I think those things are probably the hardest part about the whole installation process. Uh, if you haven't done research on Chinese diesel heaters, they give you a tank, but it's not really finished. There's a pickup thing you have to install. You have to drill holes. So it's a little bit strange. So definitely research that before you jump into this. But in my case, it was easy. So I didn't have to worry about that. What I did have to worry about is where the heck I was going to put the thing. Now, a lot of people with diesel sprinters will put them under the passenger seat. In my case, that was a little bit of a problem. While I had the space under there, I also have a bulkhead that I would have had to have gotten through for the heating ducts because of the layout in my van. That would have been very difficult because right by the passenger seat, I have a big kitchen counter and under that kitchen counter is a propane locker that I couldn't send heat through. So I really didn't have any way to do that. But being an ambulance, this thing's filled with cabinetry and there are dead spaces in that cabinetry. And I found a very nice dead space which is a dead space is just a space that's not being used for anything underneath the cabinets. It fit, it fit perfectly. And I looked under the van and I had a very narrow space where I could fit the pipes to come through the bottom of the van. So that's, that's where I did it. And that, that actually worked out. First tip, absolutely. Before you start doing this, measure very carefully as to where you're going to put it and make sure all your pipes are going to fit. If I had drilled holes an inch off in either direction, I would have had to have drilled more holes because I would have hit bracing under there. So this can be a little tricky in a van because if you're inside the van, you can see the clear space on the floor. And if you're under the van, you can see the clear space on the floor, but you can't necessarily line those two things up. So the easiest, simplest way to do this is to drill a pilot hole. Take a very small drill bit, drill it through the floor or from underneath, drill it up. If you're near a fuel tank, definitely go up <laughs> because you do not want to accidentally drill through the fuel tank. That is a very bad thing. And then when you're done with that hole, if you can find the hole inside the van, 
put a bright light on it and then go under the van, you'll see where the hole is and you can tell, okay, this is a good space or, gee, I can't see that light at all. This is clearly a bad space. Then you fill the hole and try again. But that hole is crucially important. Now, in my case, the hole was a little bit of an adventure. The way the ambulance is built is there's a big piece of three-quarter marine plywood that covers the entire floor. This is super high quality here. Most people don't build their vans like this, but this was an ambulance. So yeah, it was built to high quality standards. That's one of the reasons people buy ambulances. And that three-quarter piece of plywood was bolted to the floor in many places, and I was able to find one of those bolts and use that to measure. Another advantage to me. But because of that three-quarter plywood floor, I did not want to mount the hot parts of the diesel heater directly to the plywood. I know people have done that, but I thought, you know, I really... I'm, not just, I'm just not comfortable with it, especially where this unit is actually going to be hidden under cabinets and I can't really watch it all that closely. So what I did instead was I got a hole saw, a good size hole saw that was exactly the diameter of the gasket that the thing comes with. And I drilled two round holes next to each other and made basically a large oval. And that's where all the guts of the hot intake exhaust and fuel of the thing went through. So I just drilled that through the floor. <laughs> and then I discovered that not only was there three quarter inch plywood that I had to drill through, there were two layers of it because when they built the cabinets, they built the cabinets with a floor. So the cabinets sit on top of this and there's one and a half inches of plywood <laughs> on the bottom of these cabinets. One and a half inches doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot. And it actually created a problem that if I hadn't done it the way I did by cutting the huge hole, I couldn't have reached anything to screw in hose clamps and such. So I did the right thing. But what I ended up with was this massive hole in the floor of the van surrounded by plywood. And that is an installation challenge. In your diesel heater kit, it will come with a metal plate. There's not a lot of instructions on what to do with that. And side note here, the instructions are just as bad as you've been warned about. They're poorly translated Chinese. They really don't make a lot of sense. You will not learn how to install your Chinese diesel heater, and you definitely won't learn how to use the controller by the manual. You should, must, please watch a whole lot of YouTube and then don't trust those and watch a whole lot more YouTube. Because <laughs> I have seen so many, no, you don't need the plate, you need the plate, you have to use the plate. No, you can't use the plate, you have to buy a turret or it won't work. All right, you're going to find all kinds of information. My information from my experience of installing this thing is that plate is to cover the big hole if you make one. It is optional. You do not need to use this plate unless you really need to, which I did because I made this massive hole. So inside my van, I've got this oval shaped hole in the floor with this metal plate over it that is screwed into the plywood very securely. And then the diesel heater fits into that plate. It's screwed into it. And then all my hoses come out underneath the van. And that works great. Doing it over, I wish I had had some high temperature gasket material, which I did not have. I would have liked to have installed that around it. But because I didn't have that and I didn't feel like going to the auto parts store, basically, I was being lazy, I just made sure it was very carefully sealed in there. And I, I'm not going to have a problem with exhaust gases because of the way I ran the exhaust. That's the hardest part. After that, it's really just hooking things up. And what I did was I pre-connected the hoses to the heater and then dropped them through the hole. And then I worried about the fuel line. Now, the fuel line, you really need to pay some attention to because it's a little bit strange. Your diesel heater will come with a fuel line. You want it to come with the hard white fuel line, not the flexible green one. The flexible green one will work, but because it's flexible, it is susceptible to sucking pressure that can collapse it. It can get damaged easily. It's not as good as the white one that is very hard and very tough. And mine came with the white one. Although as it happened, I didn't use very much of it. But you have to use some of it because the way the fuel lines work is it comes with a rubber hose that goes over the fuel pump nipples and over the heater nipples itself. And then you connect those together with the white hose with a hose clamp over the bigger hose with the white hose stuffed into it. You really need to see a picture of this. I've never seen anything like this before, except in these Chinese diesel heaters. And I had eight different fuel connections I had to do with hoses and not one of them leaked. 
So it actually worked. And I used the crappy hose clamps, also called Jubilee clips, that came with it. If you want to do a better installation, you can actually buy hose clamps just for fuel lines. They're a little bit different and they apply a more even pressure, but I didn't actually need to do that. Because my fuel tank already had an outlet on it, and I had the connector that went on it, I had a fuel hose gauge that didn't match the fuel hose that came with the Chinese diesel heater, so I needed to adapt that. And I'll have a link in the show notes for this part, too. I found this Dorman kind of multi-hose connector thing. It was like two bucks. It's not a big deal. And it's not ideal, but it does work, and I use that to go down to the smaller fuel line. But at that point, I had to buy fuel lines. So rather than even use the white fuel line that came with it, I bought some high-quality 3 8 of an inch fuel line, and I'm using that. So that is it. I did all that, and I plugged it in, and I did the priming. If you can, and this is messy, fill all the fuel lines with diesel fuel before you prime it. It is messy, it's complicated, you may not be able to do it, but if you do that, you may prolong the longevity of your fuel pump because it won't be pumping dry for so long. I had to prime my system six times in order to get diesel to come out because it had a long way to draw that fuel, and the whole time it was doing that, it didn't have any lubrication. So, not a great situation. If you can avoid that, do it. But then it worked, and I was thrilled. Uh, And now, that's basically the end of my installation story. It worked. I attached everything. It's wonderful. I had plenty of voltage. These things are voltage sensitive. They need a lot of power. They don't use a lot of power, but they need a lot to start up. So if you try to connect this to like a Jackery 500, it's probably not going to work. You're going to need more power than that because it can draw 10, 12 amps at startup. And that's a lot. I try to be extremely honest in this podcast, and I'm about to tell you the rest of the story. Holy cow, did I mess this up. (laughs) Folks, I am not a very good builder. It's true. I do it, and I overcome my lack of skill and just goofery with determination. But man, I I make mistakes that are just ridiculous. First mistake I made was I installed the thing completely, put all the cabinets back together, and tested it, and I forgot to put the gasket in. This, this gasket fits between the diesel heater and basically everything else. And generally, you use it to measure the holes. You, it has the holes already cut in it, and you can drill them out and stuff with that. And that's what I did. But I forgot to put it back. So I had to take apart everything again, and literally everything. Put the gasket on, and then put it all back. And okay, fine, I did that. I fired it up. And it needed to be primed again because I needed to disconnect the fuel line. Some air got in there. It's like, okay. So I primed the system again. And by the way, priming is something you do on the keypad that's not obvious. And that keypad or the control panel varies by which unit you get. And they have different instructions. (laughs) You are trying to get it to to say H on. (laughs) You're on your own for figuring out how to get it to say that. I don't know what H stands for. I have no idea. Anyway, I'm priming it. And... The way I have it installed, my fuel pump is outside the van, and I have it in a pool noodle, so it's very well protected, but I can't hear it at all in the van. My installation is very, very quiet, which is good, at least from the inside of the van. So I had to go outside the van to make sure it was turning on, and I get near that part of the van, and I hear clicking. That's what it sounds like. And then I notice drips coming out of the intake hose. And I stick my finger down there, and I'm like, why are there drips coming out of the intake? I can imagine out of the exhaust, but why the intake? And I smell it, and it's diesel fuel. I'm like, oh, why is there diesel coming out of my intake? And I realized I hooked up the hoses backwards. I had the intake on the exhaust and the exhaust on the intake. I mean, this would be something trivial to fix if the thing's on the bench, but after it's installed with that giant hole I had to cut through all that plywood, it was a bear to change them. And then I did, and it was fine. And then I noticed that the exhaust... Now, when you install the muffler you have to put the drain hole down. There's a drain hole in the muffler, and they don't tell you this. That has to be down, which is not necessarily convenient. And my muffler was facing right at my driver's side rear tire. And I thought, well, that's okay. Not that much heat's going to get to the tire. So I did the classic test of I put my hand on the tire, and yeah, I couldn't leave my hand there. And for me, that means, okay, this installation's not going to work. 
So I fixed that by going to Menards, the hardware store, and I bought a copper 45 degree street side elbow, three quarters to one inch. That made it possible to angle the exhaust away from that tire, and I'm pretty sure that's going to be uh, the solution there. Oh, anyway, I tell you all this because people don't show you their screw-ups. <laughs> if you watch YouTube, it's like, this is how you install a Chinese diesel heater. Isn't it easy? I did everything exactly right the first time. Yeah, I bet they didn't. I bet they made a lot of mistakes and they cut them out. Maybe not as severe as my mistakes. But I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I made all these mistakes. You might too. It's okay. Just fix it. It's annoying. It's a pain. But just fix it. Your goal here isn't to be perfect. Your goal here is to get the stupid heater installed. And if I can do it, you can do it. If you have any specific questions about my install of this diesel heater, I didn't make a video or anything because there's 9 million videos about it. Go ahead and contact me. I'm Jeff at builttogo.com. That's two T's, not three, not one. I'll be happy to share my experience with you. And uh, hey, I've got heat now and I've got a lot of it. And wow, a five kilowatt heater is more than enough for a Sprinter 144, I can tell you that. Tales from the road. Well, you know, it's October and Halloween is coming and I figured I'd tell a little Halloween-y story. Uh, there was a time growing up in Salem, Massachusetts, as I did, that Halloween time meant putting away soccer equipment. <laughs> So my dad was heavily involved in Salem Youth Soccer because I was a player and he decided to help out with stuff. And as happens with many dedicated volunteers, he got made responsible for more and more and more and more. And one of the things he was responsible for was putting away the equipment at the end of the year. Now, Salem Youth Soccer was run by the city of Salem and they would use kind of some old buildings that they had around town. And this town was founded in 1626. There were plenty of old buildings for storage of stuff. And one of those was the old Pickering School. I don't know, I don't know if it's still there or not, honestly. It's an old 19th century big brick building. Kind of looks like a little bit like a haunted house. And one night, he and another soccer volunteer showed up there with all the soccer balls and nets from all the teams in Salem, and we started loading them into a what well, used to be an old classroom. And I don't remember anyone's names, except my dad's, uh, but there was a woman and her daughter and me, and we were basically loading up this room. And I finished first somehow and went outside. Now, the Pickering School was a little bit unusual in that it was next to a cemetery, a very large cemetery in Salem. Not one of the historic ones, not one that you're going to visit unless you're a true student of history, but it's there and it's big and it's on a hill behind the school. It's, it's pretty picturesque with big trees and classic New England cemetery. I mean, you know, this is October, the leaves are gone, the moon is shining behind the clouds and, you know, it's just the perfect Halloween night. Well, we had a bunch of new soccer balls to put away, and because we were running out of space, we decided to just dump the balls in and take the big boxes they came with home to throw away, because this is before recycling. And they were these large boxes, maybe three feet tall, and kind of rectangular, and white, and I had an idea. And so I took one of these boxes and went outside, and then just waited and what happened next was either stupid or hilarious, depending on your perspective. My dad and the other folks came out of the school, having put everything away, and they're looking around for me, and they can't find me. And then when they all turn towards the cemetery, they see me and scream! Because I had set up the box in a row along the tombstones, and I was in the box with my head sticking out, and my arms sticking out of some holes I had just made. And at the very moment they looked at me, I poked out all my appendages and said, Boo! And yeah, that's the best I can do for a Halloween story. But uh, <laughs> it worked! For a very small moment in time, I was decorated as a tombstone or a grave marker or whatever you want to call it. I hope they remember that moment, because I do. Running out of time here because I've talked too much earlier, but I did want to throw in this weird place to visit. 
and this one was going to require some Googling, but it is the Hannah Dustin Memorial in Buscawin, New Hampshire. Hannah Dustin is a fascinating character from history, and I'll tell you the story as briefly as I can. She was a pioneer woman living in a cabin with her husband in a very remote village in Massachusetts. And an Indian group, Native American, Indian, that term is complicated and there's no way you're going to win that, came down from Canada and basically killed all the men and ransacked all the houses and took a lot of the women and children as slaves. But Hannah Dustin's infant daughter was crying and too much of a bother, so they actually smashed her against a tree and then carried the rest of them back up north to Canada. Along the way, they camped on an island in the Merrimack River. And during the night, Hannah Dustin escaped along with a couple of the kids, stole a canoe, and made her way back down south to Massachusetts. That's a pretty amazing frontier story there, but it, it has another side to it. This is not why there's a memorial to Hannah Dustin. The reason there's a memorial is because going down the river, she remembered something and turned around and went back. And that thing she remembered was that there was a bounty on the scalps of members of this particular tribe that had abducted her. If you don't know this, the tradition of scalping is a European tradition. And in the 50s, with all the cowboys and Indians stuff, they made it look like this was something the Indians did, which they did, but only because it was the Europeans who created the practice of scalping for money. Hannah Dustin remembered this, went back, and killed all of her abductors, including the women and children. I do think there were a couple that survived without their scalps. But she took these scalps back to town, down the river, and was lauded as a hero. And the island in the middle of the Merrimack River, it's not exactly the same island, but it's close, now has this massive statue dedicated to Hannah Dustin. And in one hand, she has an axe which is probably apocryphal. She probably didn't have an axe, but still, she has an axe. And in the other hand, she has what looks like a bouquet of wilted roses. And that's what most people think it is. But in reality, it's a handful of scalps. Every once in a while, someone goes and paints the monument red, trying to get people to remember just what a horrible incident this was. But your perspective on this incident varies, at least at the time, based on whether you're Catholic or Protestant, because at that time, there were two different worldviews competing, and the Indians who had abducted her were French-based and therefore Catholic, and her family was Protestant. And it was the Protestant versus Catholic aspect that created the monuments, and there's several to Hannah Dustin. It's a very long story, the history of Protestantism and Catholicism in New England, but... You can visit this place. It's right off of I-93. I'll have a link in the show notes. This is a very quick stop. If you're driving up 93 to go to Vermont or whatever, it is not a big deal to stop and go see this thing. And absolutely make sure you read the story of what happened in 1697 during King William's War, which you probably also haven't heard of, and why this extremely violent woman is lauded as a hero, or at least was, by several generations of New Englanders. Well, folks, I talked a lot about a few subjects, and I'm going to end it here because I don't want this podcast to get too long. But thank you very much for listening. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. And until next time, remember the words of Wu Men in the year 864. If your mind isn't clouded by unnecessary things, then this is the best season of your life.